Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Inuzor Education. Um, we are continuing talking about um, Lagrangian and Hamiltonian, which is basically part of the Physics Plus, at least initial part of the Physics Plus course presented on Unizor.com. Uh, I suggest you to watch this lecture from the Unizor.com because every lecture, including this one, has detailed notes. Uh, it's like a textbook, so you have a video presentation and you have basically a, a part of the textbook which is related to this particular lecture. And the whole website is totally free, there are no advertisements, sign-in is not necessary. Okay, <coughs> now, before addressing Hamiltonian and Lagrangian, which are basically different formulation of classic uh, physics, um, let's start with recap of Newtonian physics, and that's what this lecture is about. I would like to very briefly talk about the laws of Newton and uh, a couple of consequences from it. Again, this is just a recap. Everything, whatever I'm saying right now, was presented in the course Physics for Teens, uh, but maybe on a, a little bit m m more elementary level, I would say. Because right now, I will not be shy of using uh, differentials, integrals, uh, vector algebra, um, and I will not actually talk about what exactly this is, differential or integral. I presume that you know calculus, and you know the vector algebra, at least, and something else as well. All right, so what do we start with? Okay, first of all, we start with a concept of inertial frame. Uh, classic um, Newtonian mechanics assumes that there is something which is called inertial frame. Well, this is something which can be referred to as far as coordinates, as far as velocities of uh, material points, or we will call it objects sometimes. Um, so, um, and in that inertial frame, um, with whatever velocities and uh, coordinates and uh, other concepts we are actually dealing with, uh, the laws of Newtons are actually held, and we take them as axioms, and I will talk about this axiomatic approach uh, again a little bit later. So, inertial frame, uh, ca as an example, for example, for example, it can be um, like a coordinate system in our Euclidean 3D uh, space uh, related to um, stars, for example. They are relatively stable um, on our sky and, uh, well, basically, I mean, we know they are not, but for whatever the purposes of classic physics are, now these uh, stars and the inertial frame related to these stars can be considered actually inertial and the laws of Newtons according to our experiments definitely do hold within this particular inertial frame. So inertial frame is one thing. Now the next thing is uh, I would probably be talking a lot about something called material point. Material point is an object which has zero length, width, height so it's kind of a point, basically. It's a mathematical point, but it has inertial mass. So this inertial mass is a characteristic of this, of this object, and it basically relates the forces which are acting on this uh, particular object and the result of these forces, change in position, velocities, etc. So material point, and the next one, as I was saying, is the force. Now, the force is presumed acting on this object. Uh, it depends on the time t, and it's a vector in three-dimensional um, world. Now, position of this particular point um, is um, a vector which has three components. I mean, if you wish, you can represent it as x of t, y of t, and z of t. Again, t is the time, 
and as the time goes we are assuming that position is changing all three coordinates are changing forming a trajectory so trajectory is just yet another term which I'm introducing so it's basically all the places where our material point which is moving under certain forces uh, it, it's taking um, all these points are taken in our Euclidean three-dimensional world now velocity velocity is nothing but derivative of position by time or if you wish you can represent it as again three coordinates x of t by dt d f of y by dt and d z of t by dt it's a vector so force is a vector position is a vector velocity is a vector okay now the first law of Newton well, the first law of Newton is saying that, again, this is the recap, you're supposed to know all this. In the absence of uh, any external forces, so it's f if f is equal to zero, it's a null vector. Then what follows is that The velocity is constant, which means the object is moving with certain velocity and certain with certain speed in a certain direction, uh, and it's not changing. Or in other world, in other words, you can say dv for dt is equal to zero. That's the same thing, basically. If it's if it's constant, it's derivative is equal to zero. And again, whenever we're talking about vectors, we are talking about all three components. So it's Vx, v, 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 Vy, and Vz components. Each one um, are constant, and uh, each one has um, derivative by time is equal to zero. So that's, that's all about the second, uh, uh, the first law of Newton. Okay, now the second law, Okay, the second law is basically relates the force and the change in velocity, which basically usually is called acceleration. But we will, we will not use much uh, an acceleration, we will use just velocity and acceleration, which is actually a speed of a rate of change of velocity. It's basically a derivative of velocity or if you wish second derivative of the position all right so what is the second law second law says that the force as a vector is equal to uh, mass times rate of change of velocity that's what actually it is now in other words there is another concept right now which I will introduce now I introduce it here momentum it's mass times velocity so in which case I can say that this is derivative of momentum if m is here I can put it under differentiation so that would be uh, uh, derivative of momentum. Momentum is also a vector. So this is vector equation, which means it's by coordinates. Okay, now, from this I can actually change it a little bit, multiplying by uh, differential of time, and I will have now this thing is called impulse and this is momentum so increment of impulse of the force because the force ba ba basically you can say this is the df of t 
So increment of impulse is equal to increment of the momentum of object. Okay, no, we don't really need it right now. So that's the second law. Okay, now the third law. The third law. Well, the third law is about two objects. If there is nothing else, just two objects, which somehow affect each other. Maybe they're connected with a spring. Maybe they are. Um, uh, maybe they are the sources of gravitation or or some kind of electrostatic force. Whatever the force between them exists, whatever the force one object acts on another, there is a corresponding opposite force, which is exactly the same in magnitude, but opposite in direction. So, F A B, this is the force from object A to object B, is equal to minus F uh, of T B A. So the vector of force, which is from one object to another, <coughs> or maybe let's say you have um, some kind of an object lying on a flat surface in the uh, gravitational field. So whatever the object pushes onto the surface, the surface pushes back to the object. And that's why uh, they are not moving against each other. They are actually um, uh, they're experiencing exactly the same forces in, in opposite direction and that's why relative movement is not there. So this is the uh, action and counteraction. Uh, they are always um, equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. So all of this you know or you're supposed to know. Maybe not in this particular formulation, maybe with um, less differentials and uh, you can talk about the average speed or something like this, which is basically <coughs> an elementary um, replacement of more exact. This is uh, basically the, the real uh, mathematically correct expression <coughs> um, of these three laws. And again, when I was introducing these three laws in the course, in the prerequisite course called Physics for Teens, um, I probably did it a little bit more elementary. Uh, so I was kind of introducing the person maybe mm, still n supposed to know calculus and vector algebra, etc., but maybe not in the same level. This is a, 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 a rigorous mathematical definition of three laws. Okay, now let's move on. Next, um, a couple of notes, basically, about all of this. First of all, mass. <coughs> mass is additive, so to speak. So if you have two different objects and you are combining them into one object, the mass of this combined object is equal to sum of the masses of components. So mass is additive. Okay, that's number one. Number two. Forces are also additive, but forces as ve are vectors, which means they are supposed to be added as vectors. So if you have two different forces acting on the same object, then you can add them together, and that would be the equivalent of these two, um, as if these are two vectors added together. So forces are added as vectors. Now. Um, and obviously, whenever I'm talking about vectors, I'm talking about certain equalities by coordinates. So if two vectors are equal to each other, it means that the x-coordinate is equal to x-coordinate, y-coordinate equal to y, and z to z. Okay. So whatever I was talking before, all these three laws of Newtons are in Newtonian mechanics 
are supposed to be accepted basically as axioms. Nothing you can do about and the only thing you can do is basically experimentally check if they are correct or not. And within our level of precision, these uh, are uh, definitely held and can be considered as axioms in our day-to-day um, -day mechanics, so to speak. Um, yes, obviously, um, contemporary physics, which includes relativity and quantum physics, etc., is saying that in some cases, some extreme cases, extreme speeds or extreme size, small size, it's not exactly axioms because they are not really adhered to. However, at our level right now, at the level of basically up to end of 19th century, they can be considered as axioms. All right. Now, now we will go to conservation of momentum. Let's say we have an object, and this object is basically uh, uh, moving in three-dimensional space. Um, also, there is another object, and these objects somehow are interacting. So there is something like a force between one to another or another to the first one, and no outside forces. So it's a closed system, completely closed system. Now, we have two moments of time. T1 goes to T2. So, at moment T1, both objects have certain mass and certain velocity vectors, which means both objects have certain um, momentum. So, object A has certain momentum, and object B has certain momentum at time T1. Now, at time T2, they have correspondingly momentums of T2. Okay, now, there are forces which are acting. So there is a force AB of T. Now, these are all vectors. And there is a force FBA of T which is opposite in size, in direction, and um, equal in magnitude. All right, now, as we were talking before, when we were discussing the second law, we were talking about uh, d uh, p of t, uh, is equal to f of t times dt. We were just talking about increment of momentum is caused by basically increment of um, impulse of the force. And again, these are vectors. So this is our very important thing. How can we, how did we come up with momentum at point t2? Well, we had a momentum at t1 and then the force from B to A is basically changing all the time, acting on object A, it's changing its momentum, which means my momentum at time T2 is equal momentum at point, uh, sorry, T2 at T1. of object A plus all increments of this momentum. What does it mean, all increments? Well, I'll just write it down and you will, I'm sure you will agree with me. That's what it means. This is infinitesimal increment at moment t, and if we, if we will add all these infinitesimal moments, which means we integrate this differential, we will get what we want. So this is the total sum of all the increments of all the momentums at all the infinitesimal um, uh, increments of this momentum from moment t1 to moment t2. So again, the, moment, the momentum at t2 is equal to momentum at t1 plus all increments which are caused by the force. Now, what the force is acting, 
it's the force FBA. So instead of this, I can use this. So beginning plus integral from T1 to T2 instead of differential of momentum I will have differential of time so this is vector from B to A right? very simply great so you know what? I will use it here it will be easier for me Okay. Now, absolutely analogously, let's talk about the B. Its initial momentum at point T1 plus all increments of momentum caused by the force which is acting on object B. Object B is uh, from A to B. So it's A, B. OK, what will be if I will add them together? I will have this, the total momentum at point T2 plus total momentum of the B object of point T2 equals mo sum of these momentums at T1 plus this and plus this but sum of integral is integral of sum and I will have FBA plus FAB and they are of opposite sign and uh, the same magnitude so I will have zero here which means what? momentum at the end, momentum at the beginning are exactly the same this is the conservation of momentum so if, if it's a closed system and there are two objects which are somehow interacting which is uh, which I each other no matter what interactions are the total momentum remains the same that's very important that's the conservation of momentum okay done let's move forward Now, now we will introduce a concept of work. Now, in the old, I will say, elementary kind of world, work was equal to force times uh, distance. Obviously, assuming that force is um, acting along this particular distance s, and it's constant, doesn't really change, and that's what the work is. Now, in a more, uh, I would say, um, contemporary, uh, if you wish, definition, let me do it this way, work uh, at the segment of time from T1 to T2 is equal to, well, well again we are um, dividing our interval from T1 to T2 on um, infinite number of infinitesimal uh, um, uh, segments dt and uh, on each one the force is f of t and the distance is dr of t this is differential of position right but i have to really use this dot multiplication these are vectors because if the force is at angle to the um to the direction then you have to multiply it by, if you remember, by cosine. So if this is the force, this is S and this is F, then you have to multiply it by cosine. But if you multiply fo uh, force uh, by cosine and by the length of this segment, that's actually a scalar, sca sca scalar product of of two vectors. So this is a scalar product. And you have to integrate it from T1 to T2. You have to sum 
This is basically a correct definition of work, which is performed by uh, force F, obviously changing with time, <coughs> along a trajectory which is defined by vector R as a function of T. Okay, this is the definition. Another definition which I wanted to make is a kinetic energy. Now this is vector square or vector by vector. You can consider it as a scalar product, right? And this is therefore this is scalar. Obviously, depending it depends on time as well. So this is the definition of kinetic energy. <coughs> and now what I would like actually to do is the following. Let me change this to equal, instead of uh, differential of um, position, I can use um, velocity times differential of time. Okay. So it's f of t times v of t times dt. And now this is also scalar product. Okay. Now instead of v, I can use that would be easier for me. P of t divided by m, right? Momentum is mass times velocity. So velocity is momentum divided by. Um, now. Let's consider what is this and this. Well, if you remember, this is differential. This is the differential of impulse, right? Which means it's equal to differential of momentum. So it's equal to integral of t1, t2, t2, p of t divided by m differential of momentum. So f of t times dt is equal to d p of t. This is the second law basically of Newton. Now we can integrate it. That's very simple to do. The integrate uh, integral of this is equal to p square of t divided by 2 right? Integral of x dx uh, is uh, x squared divided by 2 because the derivative of, of, of x squared divided by 2 is uh, 2x divided by 2 which is x and dx. Okay, so that, that's what it is and I have to put it from t1 to t2. The formula, newton leibniz formula from uh, definite integration. Which means it's equal to what? It's equal to 1 over m p square of t2 minus p square of t1. Now, let's go back instead of p I can put mv so it would be m square m square v square minus v1 uh, v of t2 t two square minus v of t1 square now m square divided by m is m and what do we have? m times v of t2 is kinetic energy at point t2. So I can, instead of this, I can put t of t2 minus t of t1. Now, what's interesting is, this is a scalar equation, not the um, vector equation. So from vector equation with all these integrals we came to the scalar one. So the, if there is a work performed um, on some 
object by some force, then the, the work which is performed is equal to increment of kinetic energy. So work is converted into kinetic energy. The more work you perform, the more difference between beginning and the ending of kinetic energy is. Now this work is basically a function of trajectory, right? So because we are applying certain force on every point. These two points are two different scalar values in the beginning and at the end. So we have basically replaced the integration with just the difference between two values of kinetic energy. That's what the, the purpose actually of the entire thing which I'm trying to do because whenever I'm moving towards Lagrangian, I will actually do exactly the same. Something which is related to entire trajectory would be replaced somehow with one particular quantity which we would like to deal with one scalar, one function of it. Okay? So, that's it. That's basically all I wanted to talk about. Um, it's a very, very brief recap of very, very basic things in Newtonian mechanics. I will move a little bit further along the Newtonian mechanics, but I will always try to move you towards something related to this particular thing, how we integration replace with basically a difference between two different values. Because that's the direction where Lagrange actually took when he built his Lagrangian formulation of Newtonian mechanics. In some way it's simpler and whenever we are considering a complicated systems that's where actually the benefits will be. Okay, I would suggest you to read the notes for this lecture. So you go to Physics Plus, you choose the Newtonian um, view of uh, physics and that's where this recap actually is. I think that's the first lecture in the Newtonian um, approach. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much and good luck. <laughs>